So hi everyone, if you haven't done so already, I really need you to go and download the Excel uh, file in the Slides channel. Okay, relating to this chapter, I link it there in the chat. So do that, go download it, don't edit it straight away because it's a shared file and not everyone can do it at once. So download it so you can have your own copy and don't destroy the online copy. Okay. Right. Um, we're going to use it later, but for now, let me give you a little introduction. There are also a few videos to watch today. Um, well, two videos to watch just on how is it, yeah, how to use correlation and how to make sure you know how to evaluate data. So here, this is biodiversity classification conservation chapter. So this is under chapter 18. Um, just a little recap, we have three parts in this chapter, classification, biodiversity and conservation. In classification, um, it's quite easy, really. A lot of memorization here, but most of the things you already know. It's just a recap. Mm -hmm. So that's all the classification stuff here. And the next part is biodiversity. So um, if you are on track, you should be already, um, you should be already on um, I have already covered these parts here. So we have one video on just the definitions and how to calculate biodiversity using the Simpsons Index. And then the second question is how to assess the distribution and abundance of organisms in a local area. And this is using the tree sampling techniques, uh, which is very, very important for paper five. Don't say I didn't tell you. And number three, which we're going to answer today, is how to see the effect of abiotic and biotic factors on the distribution and abundance of species. And in this particular um, part, we're going to do we're going to do two different correlation tests, which is our last correlation test, Spearman's rank and Pearson's linear correlation. I saw someone raise their hand just now. Is there any problem? If you can't hear me, let me know in the chat. OK, I can observe the chat. I've got two screens now. Uh -huh. OK, wait, let me put up the right slides. So before we go into the two statistics tests, um, let's talk a little bit about uh, scatter graphs. So in a normal setting, uh, when you receive your data, um, your data is usually paired. Okay. So the first thing you should do is to plot a scatter graph. Okay, in the field. Okay, imagine you do an experiment. The first thing you do is not do a statistics test. The first thing you'll do is to plot a scatter graph because it's just easier, honestly. And we're going to do that in a second. Um, what do you mean by paired sets of data? And this is when we look at our data here. Okay, ignore Simpsons. Let's go to Pearson's. <clears throat> okay, so um, this is paired set of data. So um, this here is um, relating to a uh, later um, example I'm going to show you. You know what, let me go show you the question now. So student wants to know the number of galls on the leaf was correlated with the surface area of the leaf. So these are galls. So this is like bumps here and it's usually caused by insects, bites, okay, or like some insect things. So it's actually a problem for the leaf. And this student actually calcul calculated the surface area of the leaf as well as the number of galls. So uh, he calculated this on, say, 15 different leaves. So not a lot of leaves, but 15 of them. Uh, calculated the surface area of each leaf, front and back. And then calculated the number of galls in each leaf. You can see that this data is paired. What do you mean by paired? That means this leaf one has a surface area of 101 and number of galls of 180. This is on the same leaf. Okay, this is on the same leaf. This here again is on the same leaf. You cannot, you cannot um, just simply rearrange the number of galls. You know, they are paired with a leaf. This and this is paired to leaf one, this and this is paired to leaf two, and so on and so forth. This is what we mean by paired data. Um, you can use a different scenario here, and this is Spearman's. I think it's easy to understand. You can see here that the person used 10 different quadrats, and then they measured the number of species R and species S in each quadrat. Again, you can see the data is paired, right? Um, R has 38 in quadrat one, S got 24 of them in quadrat one. Can you reshuffle this 
within species S, can you reshuffle within species R? The answer is you cannot, right? Within quadrat one, this is the number of R, this number of FS. They are linked, they are paired. You cannot just simply shuffle them. So that's what we mean by paired data. And the first thing to, to do with that is really to plot a uh, scatter graph. And um, this is something we will do uh, with the data that I just showed you later. Okay, we will do it in Excel. Yay, so we don't need to do manually. So, um, yeah, other, other, um, other examples include, and these are examples in your textbook as well as in past years, right? Percentage cover of plant A species, percentage organic matter in soil. So maybe you take a quadrat, you put it in a location, you cut, calculate the percentage cover of plant species A, and then you somehow measure in the same quadrat the percentage organic matter in the soil. Again, it's in the quadrat, so it's linked. The plant species co percentage cover and percentage organic matter in the quadrat, that data is linked, it's paired. The next one is age and glucose levels. So we look at one human being. We take its age, okay, take the person's age, and take the person's glucose level. Again, that age and glucose level is paired in the same person. So it's linked. You can't simply shuffle, it's linked. Okay, you can't separate the pair. Okay, and then you take this, you do the scatter graph already. You look whether the data is linear or skewed. Okay, so um, linear as, I think linear and skewed means the same thing here. Okay, although it doesn't sound like it. Um, linear as in it's a straight line. Skewed as in, is it, is it a positive correlation or a negative correlation? And how strong is it? So if you look at this kind of proportional graph, directly proportional graph, when x increases, y increases. Right? And uh, here there's a strong positive correlation. But then if it's not so steep, then this means that it's a weaker positive correlation. Or if it goes the other way, it means when x increase, y decrease, so it's um, inversely proportional. This means it's a strong negative correlation. And obviously we can go on, so if it's not so steep, then it's weak. Uh, and if it's between that, it's a moderate negative co correlation. And you realize that this, um, this analysis is quite subjective, isn't it? There's no value here. Um, you can just look at the stimulus graph and like, I think it's less steep, so therefore it's a weaker correlation. There's no quantitative way of saying that this is exactly, this is really strong or this is really weak. This is a quite a blurry line. It's not, you know, we just, it's quite subjective. So um, we use, obviously, the correlation coefficient. Uh, we find the correlation coefficient using statistical tests. So instead of saying that, oh, it's strong, it's weak, or it's mild, or it's moderate, okay, or it's no correlation at all, there's no pattern to this at all, we can say that, hey, this data has a correlation coefficient of 1, or negative 1, or 0, and anything in between. 0 means no correlation, negative means perfect negative correlation, and positive 1 is perfect positive correlation. It's very, very rare that you get perfect correlation. Um, the data just is in between negative 1 and 1, positive 1. So it's somewhere just in between here. If your data you calculated, I mean your correlation coefficient you calculated is more than one or less than negative one, then you know there is a definitely a problem with your calculation. Okay, but there is a caveat. Okay, there is a but. Correlation is not everything. Just because x increases when y increases, so if x increase, y increase, it doesn't mean that x has caused y to increase. Okay, correlation does not equal causation. What does that mean? Okay, for to illustrate this point, I feel like a video does a better job. Okay, and it's very important. They do ask this in past year paper, uh, but this video just helps you clear it up. So um, let me go find a video. Find a video. I have it. Okay. Um, hang on. Let me start. Da, da, da. Share computer sound. Yes, yes, yes. Let's do that. 
can see. All right. Tell me if you can't hear, okay? Welcome. I came here today to warn you about the dangers of ice cream. You may not be aware of this, but these innocent looking cones full of sweetness are one of the major causes of drownings. And I've got the numbers to prove it. So if you plot a graph of the number of ice creams that are sold and you compare it with the number of drownings, you can see there is clearly an upward trend. And I think it's very safe to conclude from this that we should ban ice cream because it's very dangerous. <laughs> Since you are all smart people, you've probably figured out there's something wrong with my example. What's really happening here is, of course, that there is an underlying factor, which is nice weather, you might have guessed it. And if the weather is nice, more people will go out swimming and unfortunately drown. And at the same time, more people will buy ice cream. And it's not the ice cream that's causing the drownings. And here it's really easy to see that there is something wrong. But Jumping to an incorrect conclusion about causality when you see a correlation is the most often made logical mistake. And today my goal is to make sure that in the future you can recognize this mistake. And I really hope you can avoid making it in the future for yourselves. And I'll do this by just giving some famous uh, examples. And the first one is really rather innocent. The fact is that married men live longer than single men. If you look at the statistics, you see that this is really happening. And uh, women's magazines, they like to conclude from this that marriage is very healthy for men because it makes them live longer. <laughs> well, a friend of mine, uh, he likes to joke that marriage mainly makes life seem longer, but <laughs> that's because his wife is... Um... <laughs> But so, can anyone guess what's going on here? Because there is a causal relation, but it's the other way around. The fact is that men who are healthy and rich and well-educated and have a much higher life expectancy, these are the men that are much more likely to find a wife. That's the way women are. And the guys who have a very low life expectancy, so they're unhealthy and poor, they are not as likely to get married. So it's the high life expectancy that is causing the marriage, not the other way around. Well, and this, of course, you know, it's not so serious. No one will get married just because he read this. So let's move on to a more serious example. It was also more serious research. In Nature was a study in 1999 that showed that young kids who sleep with the lights on, that they have a much higher probability of becoming short-sighted later in life. Well, and the researchers, they were smart and they wrote very careful that they had found the correlation and they didn't know how the causal relation might work, but just to be sure they advised all parents to turn off the lights at night. And in the popular media, this became that bed lamps were night abuse, uh, children's abuse, and that it was very bad if parents used lamps in the bedroom. And many parents were worried. I can imagine if this would have happened when my son was sleeping with the lights on, I would have felt really bad. But luckily, the article had to be corrected the next week. And maybe some of you can guess, if there are biologists in the, in the audience, they know. Uh, Short-sightedness is genetic. And so it's parents who are short-sighted, and those are the parents who like to leave the light on in the bedroom. And they also are the parents who have short-sighted kids. So again, you know, a simple mistake, easy to make. Then what is, I think, uh, the worst example I know, I know many of them, I see at least one of these in the newspapers every week, but this is a classic one. In the 70s, researchers found that there's a very strong link between kids who do well in school, get good grades, and kids who have a high self-esteem. And they concluded from this that it's very important to make sure that young kids are you know, raised to be confident and proud of themselves, because if their self-esteem is high, the good results will follow. And this was what was told to parents, especially in the US, for generations, that just make sure that your kid is proud and confident, then all will turn out well. And many years later, someone did another study just to see in which direction the cause was working, and they found that it was in the opposite direction. So the good grades were causing the self-esteem, and self-esteem wasn't causing good grades, 
and it wasn't the, it was even worse so kids who are raised just to have high self-confidence and not excel at anything it can be sports or music doesn't have to be school but kids who are just proud of themselves and then fail at everything in the end they will have a very low self-esteem and not be able to make anything of their life so this was a very serious correlation mistake and what I want for today is for you to remember that the next time someone wants to prove that there is a causal relation between something and something else, it can be anything. It can be vaccines and autism. It can be female bankers and the financial crisis. And if they point out to you that there is a very strong relation, remember that it's not enough to have a correlation. It gives a very good hint of what might be happening. But before you can conclude that one thing causes something else, you need to know why it does and how it does. So when in doubt, just remember the ice cream. Thank you very much. So that was fun. She's so cute. I love her. <laughs> of course. Um, not that I know her. Anyways, um, so the point here is that correlation does not cause causation, it does not equal causation. And this is actually a very deadly, like sometimes it can have a very um, deadly effects if you do draw the wrong conclusions. Okay, just because X increases when, when Y increases, doesn't mean X causes Y. It could be Y causing X. It could be X causing Y, of course, that's one possibility. Or there could be another factor involved, so maybe factor Z, that is influencing both X and Y. So correlation, just because you see a graph that is cute and nice and like beautiful straight line, doesn't mean that you have found something very impressive. Okay, or it doesn't mean that you can simply say that, oh, X causes Y. You have to find out how it works and which direction the cause, causality is acting upon. Uh, and if you're doing research, okay, uh, in any science subject or even social sciences, this will become very, very important. Okay, don't be dumb. All right, so that is, that is about correlation. The idea that correlation does not equal causation. Now let's go on to how to calculate correlation. Okay, this is important, but we also need to know how lah, okay? So let's go to Pearson's linear correlation first. This is our third statistics test. So the first one being chi-squared, second one we did was t-test. This is the third one, it's about correlation. Uh, and just so you know, um, when we talk about chi-squared tests and t-tests, we are finding significant difference. But in this case, we are finding significant correlation or a significant relationship whoops typo here there is no significant so when we write on our hypothesis it should be there is no significant relationship or significant correlation between this set of data and this set of data okay so it's no longer significant difference it's sort of significant correlation because it's a different set test i have failed in spelling okay so um there are differences in Pearson's and linear correlation. Most of it is really the requirements. So Pearson's is for continuous data and, and Pearson's, uh, sorry, Pearson's is for, and then the other one, which is Spearman's, they all sound like toothpaste to me. So Spearman's uh, is for discontinuous data. Okay, so Pearson's for continuous. Uh, both sets of data should be normally distributed. Um, the scatter graph that you drew just now should have indicated a linear or skewed relationship already. So then you do this test. And you need to make sure you have five or more pairs of data in order to make sure this works. So not too little data, it has to be five or more. Uh, Pearson's correlation coefficient is represented by the letter R. And this is the equation right here that they will give you Okay, during the exam, so no worries. All you need to do is to find the mean of, of x and mean of y. Okay, so one that does x, one that does y. Uh, sum, times 
the x and y and sum it up. And you need also the standard deviation. And standard deviation punya formula is usually not given. So there are three different formulas you need to remember, not the statistics ones, right? Not the usual complicated ones like this, but you do need to remember standard deviation, you need to remember standard error, and you need to remember Simpson's index of biodiversity. Okay, so yeah, this one they expect you to remember. Okay, they just give you the formula like this only. Okay, so um, let's move on to the example. So like the data we saw just now, again, this is a leaf and how many gulls are on it. So surface area of the leaf and number of gulls on the leaf. Uh, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to state the null hypothesis. Does anyone want to give a shot in the chat? Does anyone want to give it a shot? Okay, now mind, I'll just talk to myself for now. So instead of there is no significant difference, this is a correlation test. So the, the null, hypothesis, null hypothesis should be there is no significant correlation or relationship between surface area of leaf and number of galls on the of leaf. Sure. So it's not significant difference anymore, it's significant correlation. The second thing is to plot a scatter graph, and the third thing is to calculate Pearson's correlation coefficient and determine the strength of the correlation, and obviously whether it's positive or it's negative. And to do this, we are going to be using Excel. Why? Easier. <laughs> and also, um, even though exam won't come up, won't ask you to use Excel, um, it is part of your syllabus to learn how to use Excel to do stuff. <laughs> it is part of the syllabus to learn how to use Excel to do stats. Okay, so uh, what, what kind of data do we need? We need to times X and Y, so this here is X, this here is Y. Oh sorry, we need to first plot a scatter graph, let's do that first. A scatter graph. How do you plot a scatter graph? So if you have Excel right now in a laptop, um, I hope you can split screen or minimize me and focus really on doing the Excel. Okay, or just you know drag to the side and like you know do this. Okay, anyways, um, I'm just gonna show you this. Um, you highlight surface area number of calls, don't highlight leaf. Okay, and what you're gonna do is you press insert and you go to recommended charts. Okay, when you go to recommended charts, they will automatically show you the scatter chart, and this is really what you want. So press OK, and ta-da, you have your scatter graph here. Obviously, this is not perfect. Um, there's no axis titles. Uh, you can change that. You can make sure you have some by clicking chart design up here, going to chart titles. Okay, if I'm going too fast, let me know. Then you can change the title so you can type it in. So I'm just gonna very lazily copy. So surface area, number of gulls. So um, by looking at the data, you realize that um, this is surface area. And this is number of gulls. Okay, I'm just going to delete the title. So yeah, this is uh, the X and Y axis label already. Uh, just in case you're wondering how I know which X is this and what, um, this is usually the X axis, this is usually the Y. La. Okay, and also if you hover over one of the points, you will see the coordinates. So you can see here it says series, number of goals, point 47, and the coordinate is 4788, and 4788 is actually this data right here. So this is the x, x this is the x coordinate, this is the y coordinate. Okay, and uh by the way, we cannot see if it has a trend line. Um it doesn't have the line, right? It just has the plots. Uh, we can change that, we can add that as well. So you can uh click add chart elements here, you can go to chart design again, add chart element, same thing. Um, and then you're gonna add trend line. 
I'm going to make it a linear trend line. You should see this. So, um, you also may have realized that there's a lot of unused space in this particular scatter graph. And can you get rid of it? And the answer is yes. Computers are smart. You can do that. So, if you go add chart, uh, no, no, I forgot how to do this. If you double click um, the axis, right? So, you go to axis and you double click, you should see format axis come out. And that's usually how I get it. Um, and you can go to this little bar chart here, go to axis options, and actually you can tweak what is minimum and what is maximum. So since the minimum here looks like it stops, it starts at 44. So I'm just going to put 40 as the minimum. You can see how it starts with 40 now and not zero. And uh, for this one, double click. Hey, oh yeah, that's correct. So I don't get my empty spaces. Ta -da! And that's how you plot a scatter graph in Excel and make it nicer. Of course, there are more customization, customization you can do to this. You can change the round circles into crosses. You can change the colors. You can change the font. You can even make like different, you can make, you customize each and every dot. Um, you can customize and make it like little floating heads or something, whatever. Uh, and if you want to know that, how to do that, you can sign up for ICDL advanced presentation, uh, sorry, advanced um, spreadsheets and you'll learn it. Ha ha ha. Okay, some of you have already taken ICDL. Uh, maybe you can ask them what's going on. But yeah, here is our scatter graph done, very easy saves more time than doing it manually. This is why we're doing it on Excel. So we can see here that there is a linear relationship of some sort. It is um, not very strong correlation per se. Maybe I say maybe it's moderately positively correlated, moderately positive correlations here. So how do we confirm that? We do a third test. Ta -da! So again, we're going to use Excel. Um, first of all, we're going to times all of this because we need sum of x, y, right? So find x, y to begin with. So I'm going to type equals and then click on the cell. So B2 times C2. And then I'm going to press enter. Am I too fast? Do you guys already know how to do this? It's live skills, guys stuff you actually use in real life when you go work. Okay, after you do that, um, you can go to the side of the box in this like green color right bottom corner. If you hover, you'll see that your mouse turns into this black plus sign. You can click, you can, and then you can drag, hold, drag, and then drop. And what this does is it copy paste the entire row for you and it applies that formula to every other row. So that you have your x, y now. Let's do a sum. Okay. So let's sum x, y together. And what, how we do that is going to equals sum. Open bracket. Highlight. Enter. So equals sum open bracket this fella. And what it does is it sums XY for you. Ta-da! You're done. Okay. Throw away this one. Where? Where is in the way? Okay, the next thing you should do is to um, find the mean and find the standard deviation for X and set Y. Um, and you know what? I feel like it makes sense to do it right underneath it. Make sure my formula didn't change. Yep. Okay, so we're going to find the mean for both of x and y, and we're going to find the standard deviation. Let me just write s. So how do we do this? Obviously, we're going to use formulas. You can do this manually as well. It just takes longer. Of course, in the exam, you do need to make, do it manually. So equals open bracket, uh, 
equals average open bracket highlight enter Ta-da. and then for y you just drag it over Okay, so this is the mean of y, this is the mean of x. Let's do standard deviation. So standard deviation are uh, quite interesting. There is standard deviation, so it's S that ST def. Okay, and you can see here that it tells you that it you can do population, calculate standard deviation based on ad hoc population, or ST def dot S, which is standard deviation based on a sample. And this is what we want, and this is what we use in bio. And if you use a calculator, you get the same. Um, same as well. Oh, by the way, to select this, uh, you can click, you can press tab, and it automatically does that for you. I'll show you again. So ST, you can move and use your up and down to find, and then when you like it, you can press tab, and then it automatically auto fills for you. Okay. Anyways, um, you're gonna highlight this entire piece of data again. Press enter. And then do the same for y. Ta-da! So you have your data here, your mean x, mean y, your s for x, and x for y. Now we're going to calculate the r. So this is a bit tricky because there are multiple things here to consider. Okay, let me drag it down so that we need to scroll up and down. So first of all, uh, we need to minus on the top first so let's open bracket sum of x y minus okay n is 15 there are 15 leaves involved here times mean of x times mean of y i hope they do it in the right order okay just in case they don't let me put extra brackets just to be sure so do this first then do that. So I'm making brackets for it. And then do all that first and divide by, okay, bracket again, number 15 times SX times XY. SY. So standard deviation of Y. Okay, double check that formula. So sum of XX minus 15, which is N, B18. Okay, look at the color corresponding fits. Okay, and times Y mean, then divided by N, S of X, and then S. Okay, done. So after you do that, you press enter. Ta-da! And you get your value of R. Ta-da! So, the value of R is 0 0.5. 3, 3. Does that show a positive correlation? And the answer is yes. Is it moderate or strong or weak correlation? And I'll say it's around moderate correlation. It's right in the middle between 0 and 1. Right? 0 is no correlation. 1 is positive correlation. Perfect positive correlation. This is 0 0.533. So I guess it's moderate. So ta-da, we have calculated it already. Okay, any questions so far on Pearson's linear correlation? Okay, um, just to clarify things, obviously, um, you have to do this manually in the exam. They will give you the formula. Usually, they won't make you do the whole thing. They will make you fill in a few missing columns, uh, missing boxes. Just tap calculate a little bit. Okay. Um, and very often in statistics tests, they will ask you to express to a certain decimal point in the question. So you express your answers in two decimal places. So make sure you express everything in two decimal places. Okay. And then when you calculate R, use the two decimal places answers. Okay. Don't like me use the raw data because the answer that you come to is different, okay? So if they ask you to manually calculate, then you manually find, again, the two decimal places or whatever decimal place they want you to calculate to, 
Okay, and then use the calculated values in the table. So the one that you already round off in order to calculate the final answer. Then only your answer will match the mark scheme. If not, it will not. Um, but in the case that if you do use raw data, I don't think they will penalize. Like, there is a range that they accept. But just in case, you know, follow the instructions. But just in case you are lost and don't know what's going on, I did some calculations behind uh, in the Pearson's mark scheme tab at the bottom here. Uh, and you can refer to the formulas there as well as uh, calcul working there if you want. So this is me doing it manually. Okay. There is also a critical value. I shouted that, didn't I? There's also a critical value table when it comes to Pearson's correlation coefficient. Uh, let's go back to the slides for this. Slides, 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 slides. Okay, so we, we plotted scatter graph already. We found the correlation coefficient already. Okay, you can do this manually. This is a table in the slides, but we didn't. Um, now we have to determine significance. So your null hypothesis again was whether it's significantly correlated. What does that mean? So let's let's see how to do that. So first of all, you need our R value using the formula, and we got that already. And ours was 0 0.523. Calculate total degrees freedom for T test. For T test, you're kidding me. Pearson's. I will correct that and re-upload the slides. Uh, just so you know, the degrees of freedom for Pearson's co correlation coefficient is n minus 2. Okay, so number of pairs to minus 2. So how many number of pairs, how many pairs we have? We have 15 pairs. Okay. See, leaf one got a pair of data. So 15 pairs of data. Oh no, I lost it. Okay, this is not t test. Um, yep. So in this case, 15 minus two is 13. Okay, and then um, we will use this data. But you must be very careful because either n or d f can be shown in the critical value table. Please use whatever they tell you to. Usually in exams so far, they show N in the table, not DF. So even degrees of freedom is N minus 2, the table can show you N only. Okay. So of course, we will check the critical value at P equals to 0 0.05, so at the 5% probability level. And then we will see if it's higher or lower compared to the R value. Uh, in this case, we're going to ignore positive or negative signs. We're not going to see whether, no, just not going to see a sign now. We're just going to compare it to critical value. Okay, so in this case, our R is 5.33. Or did I calculate it wrongly? Oh no, it's different. I'll figure out why later. Oh, oh. Did anyone get? Oh, I know why. Because I didn't use the raw data. This one is the working according to the mark scheme. See, if you use the raw data, you get a different answer. Okay, now mine. It's okay. We will assume it's this one or five point zero point. 5.33. If you use raw data, you will get this value. If you use, um, if you round up first, then you calculate, then you'll get this value. Okay, see it differs quite a bit. In the exam, do this. Anyways, uh, let's look at our critical value table. This is df. So just now we say it's 13, right? So df 2 minus 1 uh, is, is n minus 2. Uh, we'll look at the 0 0.05 level. Uh, this one says alpha. Uh, so just ignore that. It's fine. They mean probability. And the level is 0 0.514. And your value 
indicate if we use 0 0.606 lies between these two numbers right here. Okay, so the this is where the number lies between 0 0.025 and 0 0.01. So we can say that since it is bigger than the value in the table, that the two data sets are significantly correlated, not the language, not significantly different, significantly correlated. And therefore, we reject the null hypothesis and we say that the relationship is not due to random error or chance. Again, not the language change here. Relationship is not due to random error or chance. Of course, the opposite is true. So let's look at our value. Our value is indeed higher than the critical value. In fact, it is higher than this value. Okay, if we use 0 0.606 here. And so we can say that this value, this R correlation coefficient is significant at this level. So what level is P, K, I'm going to make sure I do the signs correctly now. It's bigger, it's big, small, bigger than 0 0.01, but smaller than 0 0.025. So this R correlation coefficient value is significant at this halting level. Oops. Can't do that. Okay. So that actually for all the tests is the same. All the statistics tests is the same. As long as it's bigger than a critical value, it's significant. Finish. End of story. You should be very very good at this now. <laughs> Repeat. You know how many times already. Okay, let's do one more example. And this time we are going to do it manually. <laughs> um, and this is actually a past year, actually. Uh, where is it from? I don't remember, honestly. Yeah, but never mind. Let's, let's, let's do this experiment. Let's do this in, together, okay? So in experiments, 10 subjects were given a concentration of caffeine. Okay, so this is not an ecology, some, uh, this is not a biodiversity sort of example anymore. Caffeine. So reaction time was measuring five times for each subject and the mean is calculated. So they find a mean reaction time instead of um, just one reaction time. So good, it's reliable, very good. So this is how much they fed the person with caffeine and this is the mean reaction time. And they found that um, the less caffeine was given, the longer the reaction time. So more caffeine, shorter reaction time, faster reaction. And they plot this little graph right here. The scatter graph shows you that it's somewhat a linear relationship. Okay, somewhat, this is definitely a negative correlation since as concentration caffeine increases, mean reaction time decreases. So this is a negative correlation. It looks rather weak we don't really know we will find out using a statistical test so based on this graph student decided to use a statistical test to find a strength of the correlation between caffeine and the mean reaction time state number one why Pearson's linear correlation test is suitable for the data and the answer to all this question is the same Okay, all this type of questions is the same. Why is it suitable? Go back to the requirements. Scroll, 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 scroll. Oops. Too much, too much. Scroll back, scroll back. Okay. So every time they ask you, why is this test suitable? Then your answer should always be, oh, the data is continuous, depending on the Tesla. Okay. The data is thermally distributed. The scale graph indicates a linear or skewed relationship and there are five or more pairs of data. All of these requirements are true. This is why that particular set of data is suitable for Pearson's. Too far again. So we have answered that. This is why it's suitable. All these fit into the criteria just now. 
Then they tell you the statistical test results. Yay, they didn't calculate. So state what its value indicates about the relationship between the concentration of caffeine and the mean reaction time. It seems to be a quite a strong negative correlation, right? So when concentration of caffeine increases, mean reaction time decreases. You can say it's negative, you can say it's strong. It should have marks there already. I think it should be just one mark. Next question. Describe how the student calculated degrees of freedom. Again, degrees of freedom is n minus 2. Number of pairs minus 2. How many pairs are there just now? 10. 10, 10 pairs. 10 subjects, 10 pairs. So 10 minus 2 is 8. Then they said, Use the probability table to find out if the value for R equals 0 0.722 is significant. So here we go, looking at the table again. Realize that they didn't even put negative in front. Why? Because negative positive is ignored when you look at the probability table, when you look at the critical value table. Again, this is DF. Yeah, so use 8. Our our correlation coefficient here is negative 0 0.722. Again, you ignore this. You just look at 0 0.722. Compare it with the, the critical value at 0 0.05. So in this case, it's 0 0.632. Is it bigger than that? Yes. It's bigger than this. It's bigger than this. So it's somewhere between here again. Okay. Uh, doesn't matter. The, as long as it's bigger than the critical value, consider it a significant correlation. Oh, that's pretty much it. So this R value is significant at the P equals to 0 0.05 level. Um, more accurately, it is significant at this level. So P is bigger than 0 0.01 but lesser than 0 0.025. It is significant at this level. And that's it. We can now reject the null hypothesis that there is no significant correlation. right? So there definitely is a significant correlation. There's a significant negative correlation, in fact. And we can say that any uh, relationship is not due to chance. Any questions so far about Pearson's linear correlation? I think I went quite fast. I don't know. Can't tell. Okay, if there's no questions so far, we're going to take a short break. Um, let's say five minutes. And we're going to come back and do the Spearman's rank correlation. Five minute break, guys. See you soon.
Okay guys, so it's 9.06 and we can start now. So, um, we did the Pearson's linear correlation and it's for continuous data. So data which has like point something, point something, right? Like go back up a little bit. Reaction time got point something, point something, right? Because many seconds, it is continuous, right? Concentration also can have point something. It can be 0 0.5 concentration, can, can. Right, just now also can, um, when we talked about um, surface area and number of goals. Number of goals is not, but then surface area can be continuous data, correct? So it, could be, it could be point something cm square, no problem. But, what happens if it both data sets are discontinuous data? Okay. So we use Spearman's rank correlation. Ta -da! So this is also test for correlation, obviously, between two paired set of data. Requirements is exactly the opposite of Pearson's. Data here is discrete, not normally distributed. <clears throat> Sorry. Scatter graph shows that there's no relationship, so you still have to draw a scatter graph. You, but it doesn't need to be linear or skewed exactly, as long as they look like somewhat related. I don't know why. Don't ask me. Right. Um, there are five or more pairs of data here. And the data points within samples are independent. Means... Um, the data points are discrete. Uh. They are not, there's no point something, point something. It's number one, two, three, four. The individual one, two, and three is independent from each other. So it's count, usually numbers, okay? And obviously all individuals must be selected as random from a population. Um, this is quite normal. Uh. Okay, and this usually comes into play when we do quadrats. Okay, that's why this is under biodiversity. Because in a quadrat, usually we will calculate the number of organisms, right? And it could be from species A or species B and so on and so forth. Okay, so, and when we use a quadrat method, um, it would be random sampling in this case because individuals must be selected at random from a population. In this case, we are not really looking at distribution along like a belt transect or line transect. Okay, if you don't know what I'm talking about, you gotta refer to the most recent video that was out last week. Yeah, last week. Okay, um, yeah, so this has to be random sampling. Uh, we are looking more for how different organisms are distributed with each other. So if there's more species A, will there be less species B? Or if there's more species A, will there be more species B as well? So how is the numbers changing between the two species? Anyway, let me cut the nonsense and go to how to calculate the Spearman's rank correlation coefficient, which is now represented by RS, S standing for Spearman's, obviously. Now in this case, um, it's called rank correlation because we will be ranking our data. We are not multiplying x and y anymore. We are finding the difference in rank. What does that mean? This means you need to, you know, rank data. Lah. Okay, let me let let's let's do examples. Just easier to talk about that. So, in this case, there are 10 different 1 meter square quadrats, uh, and this P we, hypothetically, have measured number of species R and number of species R S in those different quadrats, and we really want to see whether or not they are correlated to one another. So, first of all, we need to state a null hypothesis, and the null hypothesis is the same for correlation, again, um, just like just now, you should always start with there is no significant correlation or relationship between numbers of R and numbers of S, species S, if you insist. Between. So the idea here again is significant 
correlation, not significant difference. That is for t test and chi square. Significant correlation. Then we're going to plot, plot a scatter graph, and then we will need to rank the correlation, uh, rank, calculate the Spearman's rank correlation by ranking it and determine the strength of the correlation later on. Okay, let's plot the scatter graph first, and then we'll go into uh, the details of how to calculate the Spearman ranks co correlation. Uh, for now, I'm going to give you some time. Um, go to Spearman's tab here. Uh, I'm going to give you some time so that you can plot your own scatter plot without much guidance. I want to see you do it. Although I can't really see you, then you can be just slacking off and not really doing anything. That's fine too. That's fine. You'll get more homework after this class anyway. So I'll give you like 30 seconds. Plot a scatter graph, guys. Scatter graph should look something like this. If you're done, let me know in the chat so I will stop waiting. Thank you. Anyone else is done? Plotting a scatter graph? Yep, like the post. Great. Alright, I'll continue. Well, you can see here, if you plot the scatter graph and the trend line already, that number of species are increases as with um, species S. So this is a positive correlation. But again, we do need to confirm this using a statistics test. So we do this using Spearman's rank. Why? Because, well, they both are discontinuous data. They are distinct data. They are not continuously distributed. So we are going to use Spearman's rank. And how do we do that? Okay, so I'll just assume you plotted the data already. <laughs> um, and let's just do Spearman's rank. Let's um, find out a few rules to ranking first. So to rank, we usually have a number, like a table like this. So we rank species R and we rank species S, and then we find a difference in rank. Okay, and we do this for both sets of the data and we rank within the same set of data. So we rank within species R, rank within species S. We start by ranking the smallest value as 1. Okay, you can see here that since uh, 2 is the smallest here, we start with 1. And then 8, followed by 8, followed by 13, so 3. But when we come to 4 and 5, we realize that there are two 20s. So how do you rank 4? So if there is the same value, you're supposed to share the same two ranks. What does that mean? means you 4 plus 5 divided by 2. Okay, so 1 is, this is the first value, second value, third value. There are two 20s here. So 1 has to be 4 and 1 has to be 5. But obviously they are the same, same value. So we take 4 plus 5 divided by 2, that's 4.5. So both of them get 4.5. Alright, and then we don't do five already lah, because this is these two fellas are already four and five inclusive. So we jump to six. So twenty-eight is six, and then followed by thirty-eight, seven, so on and so forth. Eight, nine, and ten. So you have ten quadrats, you should have ten um you should have one to ten here as well. Okay, you can do this manually for species S or we can use Excel to do this for us in this part with these rules as well. Yay, let's do that. 
it's so much easier. Okay, first of all, let's let's um make that data table. Okay, I'm just gonna copy it here, yeah, and then gonna drag that here. Make sure it's big enough. Okay, rank for R. Oops, let's rank for S. And then this one will be difference in rank. We're going to do that later. Define D. Okay, let's rank R first. So to do this, we're going to press equals rank. Okay, and uh, when you when you put equals rank, whoops, you will see there are two here. One would be returns the rank of a number from the list of numbers if the more than one value of the same rank average rank is returned. Size is relative to other values on this. Great. That sounds great. Right, let's look at the ne next one to make sure. Uh, if one, mo this one is about the same, but if one more, more than one value has the same rank, the top rank of that set of values is returned. So that's not what we want. We want the average rank. We want to like take four and five and then divide it. So if you want this, then you press tab on your keyboard. So rank dot average will come out, or you can type that manually in. And then we're gonna use this number. So you take this number. Okay, you can see here they give you some guidelines. Number, comma, ref, comma order. So number is this number. What is the reference? So you're comparing this number in the list of these numbers, right? And then, is it ascending or descending? So, um, the smallest number is, the smallest number is number one, ma. so it's climbing up. So it should be ascending. So it's one. Or you can just click tab, close bracket, or you can just press enter. Okay, there's one thing you should do for this though. Um, if you drag it down, you realize that this changes, this reference changes. You don't want it to change. You'll get a weird number like this. That's not good. Um, you want to lock B15 to B24. You do want to lock it. Like you want to lock it in place. You want to make sure it doesn't change. How do you do that in Excel? Well, you can, uh, there's two ways. It's either you press um, function. Uh, function f4 or just f4 and what it does is that it inserts this money signs in front of the letter and after the letter so you do the same so uh, you can again press f4 on your computer uh, or in some computers like mine you have to press function f4 or you can manually type the dollar signs before and after the b just for the reference just for the list here we don't want that to move we can we want this B15 thing to move, but we don't want B15 to B24 to move, you know? So, yep, this is the formula. I'm going to press enter. And then you're going to drag it down, drag it all down, copy paste it all. And ta-da! You're done. You realize that for every cell, if you look at the formula up top here, that the dollar signs are for B15 to B24, okay? Okay, dollar signs are here and it doesn't change, it locks it, and then the number in front changes. Good. So, again, uh, we did it all. So, you press equals, rank, and we're going to do rank.average. So, I'm going to press tab. Okay, oh, you mean manually. Never mind, let me do this first. Then you, you put the number in first, and then the reference, so the reference, the whole thing. You want to make sure to lock the reference, so to do that, you can press F4. Oops, don't do that. F4, not 4. And then comma 1, ascending. Now, manually, copy-paste this. Uh, manually, again, the smallest number will be 1, and then second smallest will be 2, so on and so forth. 
if it happens to have the same rank, same number, then you take two ranks, okay, so in this case, one, two, three, done already, ma. So left four and five. You take the average of four and five, so 4.5 for rank R, for the rank. So four, five, done. Then we will jump to six. Four and five is already done. The average is already taken. So six would be the next bigger one. Then go on to do for the rest. So rank the biggest number would be rank, the highest, uh, the biggest number rank. Okay. All right, then you do. If you're doing it at Excel, um, you're gonna do this again for your rank for S. Okay. Again, remember to lock. I don't happen there to lock it so dollar signs one then drag down you should have something like this so as you can see here one four four is the smallest number in this particular column and the rank is number one followed by five which is rank number two followed by 6, which is rank number 3. And the biggest number, which is 36 here, is has the largest number rank. I hope that's clear. If that's not clear, please let me know in the chat. Okay, I'll give you like a minute there to try it out or process. Um, again, let me know if there's any questions. So uh, to lock it, you can press F4, or not alphabet F4, but like the top of your keyboard, F1, F2, F3, F4, like, or you can function, function F4, that could be, uh, could, yeah, different computer, different keyboards will be different, but it's usually F4. Uh, if not, you can actually manually type the dollar sign before and after the letter. Manually type also can dollar sign is on your keyboard somewhere. <laughs> dollar sign is shift 4. Okay, I'll give you one more minute to just process and try it out. Let me know if you're done. My phone doesn't stop buzzing, I tell you. Throwing. By the way, if you cannot see, you cannot see my formulas when I'm not doing it. But on the next mark scheme sheet, um, the formulas are already in there so that you can actually look at them. Can. All right. So um, again, we have ranked R and we have ranked S, and now we should be finding the difference in rank because this is what's required for our formula. So the difference in rank is D, and very easy here. We're gonna press equals, and then rank for R minus rank for S. Okay, and seven minus six is one, so that's confirmed true. Copy paste downwards, so you get something like this. And according to the formula, you got to square it, yeah? So, d square is what? Equals. So, you, you can press that cell there. Then you have that top hat. I forgot what that's called. Two. So, that little hat and two. Enter. So, you're squaring d. Getting rid of that negative sign there. You can get these numbers. Again, I'll give you one more minute to like try it out, process. Meanwhile, I'm just going to make my table pretty. Two, three. 
Aha. Uh -huh. No, I hate it. Yes. I like it like this. <laughs> I'm just I'm just nonsensical now. I'm doing it for fun. It's not required. Alright, I assume you guys are there already. So um find we found D and we found D squared and now we're gonna use the formula to find R S. So it's six times sum of d square. So we have to find sum of d square first. So equals sum open bracket. Highlight. <laughs> you get something like this. You know what I mean? Let me undo my table formatting so that I confuse you less. Okay again. Well sum bracket open bracket highlight enter. So this is sum of d square. Much needed for this. Okay, what's our n? Our n is 10. We have 10 pairs of theta. n is 10, just so you know. Okay, so if n is 10, then what is our rs? So rs is equivalent to 1 minus Okay, bracket. Okay, we need to times first. So bracket again. Six times sum of e square. Bracket divided by bracket n to the power of three. So ten to the power of three. Oh, oh. click n. This one also can. And to the power of 3 minus 10, which is 10. Bracket, close bracket. You get 0 0.93636. Let me check my mark scheme. Yeah, about right. <laughs> 0 0.93636. Okay, but uh, in your exam, three sig fig or two decimal points. In this case, it makes sense for three sig fig. So I'm just going to put 0 0.936. This is our S. Uh, you can actually make the S smaller. Uh, you need to highlight it. Then right click. Then put subscript. So my fun. But yeah, that's how you do it. I'll give you a minute and then we're going to continue, okay? So just again a disclaimer, you don't use Excel in exam, yeah? I'm teaching you Excel for future knowledge. It's also part of your syllabus, <laughs> surprisingly, although it's not examined. Um, yeah, so in the exam, when you don't get an Excel spreadsheet like this, you don't get access to a laptop, you've got to do this manually. So. All these laws here apply. This here applies. So make sure you know your stuff. Okay? So um, once you got that, obviously now we have to determine significance. Yay! So again, we're going to calculate the RS value using the formula. We've already done that. Our, our, our RS value was 0 0.936. Our degree of freedom, uh, typo here, is n minus 2. In this case, it's 10 minus 2, which is 8. Just so you know, again, they can give you the critical table value with DF, so degree of freedom yeah. like this, minus 2, or n. So n, n is just 10. So make sure you um, read the tab table properly. Okay, I'll show you later an example. And then obviously in the table, we're going to check the critical value at p equals to 0 0.05. And if the critical value in the table is higher than the value calculated, this means that it is significant.
So, huh, this is a critical value table, but hey, look at the table heading. It's N, it is not DF. How many numbers do we have? 10, not 8. DF is 8, but N is 10. So you read the table carefully. This one is N, so let's use N. Uh, let's use P equals 0 0.05. This is our critical value right here, our R value, RS value. Gosh, so many typos. It's 0 0.936. Okay, and it is definitely bigger than this. It is also bigger than this value here. So our S value is significant at the P is less than 0 0.01 level. Of course, it's here. It's more than this value. Usually it's here, but now it's here. Okay. 0 0.936 here. So P is less than 0 0.01 level. Okay, and I didn't explain that quite well. Tell me if you understand. So yeah, that's our spillman correlation coefficient. And now we can conclude that since it's higher than the values table, two data sets are significantly correlated. We can then reject the null hypothesis and say that relationship is not due to random error or chance. Pretty standard, very standard, already done. Ta -da. Let's do another example. Yay. Okay, so um, this is given, by the way. This is a past year and this was given. And um, what they asked you to do is the students collected samples of soil at different distances upon each and estimated the water content. So they took soil samples at different distance. So distance is one, one data. Is it? No. Water is one data, and then they want to see the species of different plants at the same distance. And then number of species is the next data. So they are looking at the relationship between water content and the number of species. Read the question carefully. Okay. And then they said they use Spearman's rank correlation, and they rank the data as below. So let's um, look at the ranking first and how they rank, okay? So um, again, rank one should be the smallest number. Why is it not the smallest number? Why is it the biggest number? I need to check this. Okay, I'll check this and get back to you. But it seems that they have ranked the biggest number as one here. I need to read my book again. Why my book different? Okay, anyways, um, I will correct that if I'm wrong. Don't worry. Um, but in this case, it's biggest is rank one. Okay, never mind. Let's continue reading. Um, we'll see here that biggest is rank one. Then here it gets lesser for some reason. So 15 and 15, you can see that they share the same number so they set, share the same rank and the rank is five and six so one two three four this is supposed to be five or six right so you take the the average between five and six to find five point five okay um you can see 14 here is use this cost 5 and 6 is taken, so it should be 7 and 8. So the difference between 7 and 8, the average between 7 and 8 is taken, sorry. So that's 7.5 and 7.5. You can see here that last but not least, 13 and 13 is supposed to be 10 and 9 and 10. But again, they are the same. So you take the average again, 9.5, 9.5. The same goes for here. Then they find the rank difference. They find d square, and then they ask you, to find um, sum of d square. So I want you to calculate this in a while and find the rs. Okay, so calculate the sum and find the rs. Uh, while I go and check, double check again, what that ranking really is. Because maybe my book had something wrong with it. Give me a sec. But yeah, calculate the rs for now. I'll be right back.
So I'm back. Uh, I hope you found calculate RS. Uh, RS, if you calculate it properly, should be should be. Um, I don't remember anymore. Hang on. I wrote it down somewhere while I was calculating it. Should be zero point nine three six. I think. No wait, that was the previous one. I didn't write it down. Such genius. If someone found the difference, someone from the RS, could they put it in the chat so that people can compare their answers? If not, you have to wait for me to calculate. <laughs> okay, guys, put your D square, sum of D square in the chat as well as your RS value. Hmm, Yongyi got negative 0 0.919. Uh, I just checked books and it looks like the textbook says is smallest is one and then the reference books say the biggest is one so i'm confused now but the funny thing is that this other table here right this other table here was in the textbook this is like the textbook data i just change i just changed some values so that to illustrate to you this and the results doesn't seem abnormal. It seems fine. And then it also works if you rank it the other way around. I'm, I'm, I'm genuinely curious how this works now. Maybe I'll go back um, after class and I'll do some calculations, compare the different RS values if we double it. I have a suspicion that doesn't matter which way you rank it, it still works. You know, the RS value should, might be still the same. If you're interested to watch me try and calculate the two different RS values, then I guess um, you can watch. I will just continue screen sharing after this class so you can watch me calculate. Um, anyways, uh, most of you found that the RS value is negative 0 0.921. So it seems to be very strongly negatively correlated. So it's a strong negative correlation. Very interesting. Thank you for calculating that. Didn't have time to do this with you. Um, but if you applied it right, you should have gotten that value. So um, let's look at that value and say, and tell them what it shows about the relationship between soil water content and number of species present. So it has a strong negative correlation. And we need to talk about soil water content and number of species present. It means the more the soil of water, more the soil water content, it seems that the less number of species is present. All right, so the number of pairs here is 10. Okay, and then they ask us whether the correlation is statistically significant. So this is a pass here. Um, number of pairs is 10. See, it showed you number of pairs. It didn't say DF. This is not DF. This is number of pairs. So you say 10. No? So you look at the significant level of 5%, which is basically 0 0.05. This is the critical value. If our number is 0 0.921, it's way bigger than this fella here. Way bigger than this fella also. Okay, you can see it's you can see the table is like flipped. Usually the number of pairs is this way, right? But now it's horizontal. So we read it horizontally as well. I mean, we read it vertically instead of horizontally now. So um, 0 0.9 to 1, we can see is bigger than this value, bigger than this value. And we can say that this correlation is definitely statistically significant. Uh, specifically, this value, RS value, is significant at P less than 0 0.01 level or the same. Okay. It is, oh, sorry, it's a negative correlation, correct? But when we look at the table, we don't care about the, the signs. Okay. It is still bigger. We still consider it to be bigger. Okay. And it's significant. And that means it's significantly negatively correlated. And then you can go on and reject the null hypothesis and say that, hey, any relationship is not due to chance. It is not random. It really has some sort of correlation. And that's it. That's done.
for this particular example. So back to the RS, someone asked. If we reverse the rank, it's just a negative of the original. Yeah, I, I assume it will be if you reverse the ranks, it should be the same. You know what? Let me try it now. Uh, but let me conclude first, then I'll try it. Um, ah, like this should be like the post credit scene. Uh, that is my hypothesis too, and we um, will test it out in a moment. Uh, but meanwhile, let me just conclude um, with this, actually. By the way, in your general in your teams, there is this, I want to remind you that there is this file called paper five essentials guideline. And I have printed this for you before the crazy lockdown, right? I printed this for you in SEM2. And if you still have it, um, great, you should use it. Okay, but I did update it recently. So you can go and look for the differences in there. I think I updated with, um, the different equations that you need to remember. So the equations you need to remember, I put it down here. And I also updated the degree of freedom here. Okay, this part here. So if you still have it, please go and change it slightly so to correct it. Okay, um, the past year is quite confusing when it comes to correlation, degree of freedom, especially because it accepts n minus 2, it also just accepts n without n minus 2. It's very confusing. But this is the standard. Yeah, this is like the external golden standard. Like out there is correct, not just CIE. Degree of freedom for correlation is in fact n minus 2, numbers of pairs minus 2. But in the critical value table, either n or df can be shown, like I saw you just now. You need to read the table, whether it's really degree of freedom or n. Now, this table here is also very useful and I want to point it out because now you have learned all four tests. Okay, this is very useful because all four tests are for different things. And sometimes they can give you the data and they can ask you which test to use. So you need to differentiate it correctly. Okay, uh, just so you know, just so you can figure things out uh, easier, you need to first read the question whether they want significant difference or significant correlation. So if it's significantly significant difference, then it should be t-test or chi-squared. If it's significant correlation, it should be Pearson's or Spearman's. And then you must see the data. Is it continuous or discontinuous? If it's continuous data, then you should use t-test. If it's discontinuous data for significant difference, it should be chi-squared test. Chi-squared test is also often used in... Um, mostly breeding experiments, so cross here, cross there, 9331 sort of thing, um, or ecological sampling. So number of this in comparison to this environment and number of that. And these are usually not paired data, okay? So chi-squared test and t-test, not paired data. But when it comes to correlation, it's different. It's paired data, okay? And they will ask you to find correlation or relationship between x and y. Okay, if it's continuous, use Pearson's. If it's discontinuous, use Spearman's. Okay, if you don't understand what I'm talking about and you're still really confused about those four different statistic tests, I suggest you take a closer look at this table right here and um, read it first and make sure, yeah, and, 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 and make sure you understand all things. If you don't understand it, do not differentiate it, please talk to me. Okay, okay, right. Um, that's all I wanted to say for to close this particular lesson. Um, I just want to also say that next week we are finishing chapter 18. So currently our videos uh, I've posted up to conservation already. Um, only one more video to go next week. Okay. Um, in order to finish the chapter, then we'll move into chapter 19. All right, I finished concluding already. If you want to leave now, you can. But right now, I want to test the hypothesis. Whether if I reverse the ranks, whether or not my RS would be 
like 0 0.936, whether it matters. So I'm just going to do this uh, quite easily. I'm just going to change 1 to 0. So instead of ascending, I'll have it descending. I'm just going to copy that all. So you can see the highest one is 1 now. And then I'm going to change this as well. Copy it all. Okay, hey guys, it's the same. Uh -huh. So it's true. Yay. So it doesn't matter if the smallest is 1 or the biggest is 1. As long as you're consistent for R and S for both sets of data, you should arrive at the same conclusion. Interesting. I, this, I learned something new today too. <laughs> So I guess in past years, um, look at, they usually ask you to fill in the blanks, right? So you got to look at uh, the way they are ranking. Whoops, where's my slides? So this one, this past year, they already gave us the ranking. They already did it for us, this one. So in past years, if they ask you to fill in, um, observe their ranking, don't assume, and then fill in based on your ranking. Looks like it doesn't matter whether it's small, smallest one, number one, or biggest one, number one. Okay. All right, and with that, we are pretty much done. If you have more questions, please put them in the chat. If not, um, bye. Have a good day. I'll see you in the next video. <laughs>